Well, thank you for that welcome, and it's really wonderful to be here with you all at St. Mark's. I think it's four or five years since I was last here, and it's just a real blessing to be with you for the baptism and for this service together. Um, if you have a Bible or a Bible on your phone, um, I'd love you to open it at Luke chapter 10. We're going to be looking from the verse about 25. And... Um, Martin sort of touched on it. I've written a book called Where is God in All the Suffering? But at the moment, I think we could all agree that we're living in a time um, when people are really experiencing pain. Pain is quite sort of close to the surface for a lot of us. Um, our cultural moment has been described by the New York Times as languishing, a kind of deep malaise that many of us are experiencing personally perhaps professionally, but definitely culturally. And I want to suggest this afternoon um, that there is a person we can turn to in this moment and for this moment, for such a time as this. You may know that every year since 1927, Time magazine has selected an official person of the year, recognising an outstanding individual who's done the most to influence the events of the year. And in 2013, Time Magazine published a piece called Who's Biggest? And it was kind of looking cumulatively at all the most influential people in the world who stands out. And of the 100 most significant figures in history, Time Magazine concluded that Jesus Christ was top of the list. In the same year, the computer scientist um, Stephen Skiena and the Google engineer Charles Ward wrote a book together on a similar theme called Who's Bigger? And the, the idea was to work out where and how historical figures really rank, to find out who has had the most influence on humanity. And they evaluated each person by aggregating traces of millions of opinions, just like um, Google Analytics kind of ranks web pages. And they concluded that the person who has had the most influence ever is Jesus. So the most influential person to have ever lived said quite a few things about um, life and about meaning and about purpose. And all of those things are worth considering. But today, I want us to spend a few moments thinking about one of the most famous sayings of the most influential person who has ever lived. And it's a parable about a good Samaritan. Now, the parable of the good Samaritan is commonly understood as a sort of example story. It's offering us an example of what it might mean to be a good person or a good neighbor. And this story has been used by loads of different politicians, from Hillary Clinton, who wrote her book, It Takes a Village, and she called the parable an example of compassion toward people of different backgrounds. Or George W. Bush, who reasoned that the work of compassion was the work of a nation, not just a government, and he pledged that America would not pass by on the other side when they saw a wounded traveler, referring to the Good Samaritan. Or Barack Obama, who in a speech about fighting human trafficking while he was president, he said this, and like the Good Samaritan on the road to Jericho, we can't just pass by indifferent. We've got to be moved by compassion. We've got to bind up the wounds. Let's come together around a simple truth that we are our brother's keepers and we are our sister's keepers. Or perhaps slightly marginally less eloquent than Barack Obama, Gordon Brown, British Prime Minister. Uh, and during the 2007 and 8 financial crisis, he used the Good Samaritan as a pretext for his economic theory, global Keynesianism. And he said this, in a crisis, what the British people want to know is that their government will not pass by on the other side, but will be on their side. Or perhaps more on the right of politics, Margaret Thatcher, who famously said, no one would remember the Good Samaritan if he'd only had good intentions. He had money as well. 
Tony Blair, Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn have all cited the Good Samaritan at some point in their political careers. But when Jesus told this story over 2,000 years ago, is any of that what he actually meant? Was it a sort of be nice to people and take care of others and don't pass by on the other side of suffering kind of tale? Sometimes familiarity or religious experience can help make us sort of miss the context of Jesus and what he was actually saying. An American friend sent me this story about a grandparent in their church. And this is what the grandparent wrote. The other day I went to a local Christian bookstore and I saw a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. And I was feeling particularly sassy that day because I'd just come from a truly thrilling choir performance. And so I bought that sticker and I put it on my car bumper. And boy, I'm glad I did. What an uplifting experience followed. He said, I was stopped at a red light at a busy intersection and I just was lost in thought about the Lord and how good he is and I didn't notice that the light had changed. And it's a good thing that someone else loves Jesus because if he hadn't honked, I would never have noticed. I found out that there are lots of people who love Jesus. And while I was sitting there, the guy behind me started honking like crazy and he leaned out of his window and he screamed, for the love of God, go, go, go. Oh, what an exuberant cheerleader for Jesus he was. And then everyone started honking and I just leaned out of my window and I started waving and smiling at all these loving people and I even honked my own horn a few times to share in the love. And there must have been a guy from Florida the back there because I heard him yelling something about a sunny beach and I saw another guy waving in a funny way with one finger stuck up in the air and I asked my teenage grandson who was in the car with me what he thought that meant and he said he thought it was probably a Hawaiian good luck sign or something. Well, I had never met anyone from Hawaii but I just leaned out of my window and I gave him that good luck sign back. A couple of people were so caught up in the joy of the moment that they got out of their cars and they started walking towards me. I bet they wanted to pray with me or ask what church I went to. But at this point, I noticed that the light had changed. So I waved to all my brothers and sisters grinning and I drove on through that intersection. And I noticed that I was the only car that got through the intersection before the light changed. And I felt kind of sad to leave them all after that love that we'd shared. And so I slowed the car down, leaned out the window and gave them all the Hawaiian good luck sign one last time as I drove away. Praise the Lord for what such wonderful folks. <laughs> Context matters. That guy was clueless about what was going on. Now, Jesus actually told this story about the Samaritan in the midst of a conversation about eternal life. Eternal life. In Luke 10, at the beginning, someone asks him this question, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In other words, this is a person who has a deep concern about this question. Is there more to life than the material world around me? Is there more than my humdrum existence? Can I live eternally? Can I live beyond what I'm experiencing? And what is life really for? And Jesus' response to that question is to tell that person, love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself and then to tell this story. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, Luke 10, 25, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And so likewise a Levite. When he came to the place and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. 
And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own beast and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, that's two coins, and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Who are we? Who are you and I in this story? No one wants to be the priest, the religious professional, the religious person who walks by the man who's dying on the side of the road and he doesn't want to bother with him. He doesn't want to inconvenience himself and so he passes by. No one wants to be the Levite, the lawyer, whose status and position and professional standing might be compromised or irritated in some way by getting involved with this person who is suffering, so he passes by. But what about a Samaritan? Would anyone want to be a Samaritan? A Samaritan was a hated class of person, an outsider who in all the sort of jokes and stories would be typecast culturally as a villain, an unlikely source of compassion or goodness to the original hearers. But here's the kicker. In this story, you and I are not the Samaritan who gives beyond compassion and binds up the man's wounds. In Jesus' story, you and I are the man lying beside the road, betrayed, kicked, abused, attacked, and left for dead. We are the dying man on the side of the road. We are the person in need of compassion, in need of safety, in need of healing, in need of generosity, in need of love. Now, when hard and devastating things happen, it can profoundly shake us, especially if we have thought of faith as kind of protecting us on a relentlessly upbeat path to success. Suffering, disappointment, the collapse of our mental health, the collapse of our physical health, the death of a friend or a loved one can profoundly shake us. But when Jesus Christ is talking to a person concerned about meaning in life, this is how he envisages our situation. This is how he speaks of what it means to be human in this world. You see, life can feel a bit like being beaten up and left on the side of the road to die. And Jesus is saying, a loving God, a heavenly father, does not ignore, does not sanitize, does not gloss over or avoid our pain, our mess, our need. The suffering world that you and I live in is all too real to us. But the good news is that it is also real to him. So who is it that gets to experience eternal life? Who is it that that is the recipient of that answer to that question? What do I need to do? Can I live eternally? Where, Where is there meaning in this life? Who does this apply to? Well, in the words of Jesus, it applies to a person who knows what it is to suffer, who knows what it is to be traumatized, who cares about people in their life who are traumatized or suffering, who knows what it is to be falsely accused, to be betrayed, to be oppressed by people who have power, to be left, kicked half to death, dying on the side of the road. A person who knows what it is to experience sadness or to struggle with mental health, a person who is stressed out, a person who is in need. That is the kind of person that can have eternal life. Jesus is not saying, be a fake religious do-gooder, follow these rules, be a moral person, present your best side to God, put your church face on. Jesus is saying that his life and his love and his rescue are for people like you and me, 
people who live in a world where bad and sad and random things happen that hurt us. Now, in the early centuries of the church, theologians knew that this is what this passage meant. They knew that we are the beaten up man and that it is God who is the good Samaritan. Irenaeus in the second century or Origen in the third century or Augustine writing in the fourth century knew this gospel message and they lived in a traumatized world. They lived in a time when people were experiencing and were raw with the experience of suffering. And that is why these words of Jesus are so profoundly meaningful for us today as we also live in a traumatized world. Bessel van der Kolk is a psychologist. He wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And he was involved with um, coming up with the phrase PTSD. He uh, was involved in a sort of long study looking at the impact of the Vietnam War on veterans. And he said this, traumatized people chronically feel unsafe inside their bodies. The past is alive in the form of gnawing interior discomfort. Think about what this parable, how this story names how the man has suffered. And perhaps how some of us sitting in this church this afternoon have also suffered in life. They stripped him of his clothes, sexual abuse. They beat him, physical abuse. They left him half dead, alone, suffering on the side of the road, psychological abuse. And the priest and the Levite passed by, spiritual abuse. I believe we're living in a traumatized generation. We have gone through so much loss, not just with COVID, but so much loss in our culture, so much abuse. So many of us have experienced physical, mental, sexual, and other kinds of trauma. Bessel van der Kolk says, trauma victims cannot recover until they become familiar with and befriend the sensations in their bodies. Being frightened means that you live in a body that is always on guard. Physical self-awareness is the first step in releasing the tyranny of the past. He says, in my practice, I, began, I begin the process by helping my patients to first notice and then describe the feelings in their bodies, not emotions such as anger or anxiety or fear, but the physical sensations beneath the emotions, pressure, heat, muscular tension, tingling, uh, feeling hollow, and so on. He says, I also work on identifying the sensations associated with relaxation or pleasure, and I help them become aware of their breath, their gestures, and their movements. These are the words of one of the leading trauma writers in our world today, the psychologist who recognized PTSD and developed techniques to support survivors. What does the Good Samaritan do? It says, he saw, he saw the man. He sees the full extent of suffering. It says he had compassion for him. It says he went up to him, he came close. He bandaged the wounds, tending specifically to the type of wound the man was suffering with oil and wine. It says he lifted the man up and he carried him and then puts him on his own donkey and then takes him to an inn, a safe space, and takes care of him. And then he leaves provision, financial provision for him for a further period of time until his return. Who are you and who, are, who, who am I in this story? And who is the Good Samaritan? Well, if you and I are the wounded man, God in Jesus is the Good Samaritan. And coming to know God is like meeting this Good Samaritan. Jesus is saying, this is what God is like in our traumatized world. What is he like? He sees you. 
He sees me as we really are. It says he saw him. He has compassion for you and for me. And that means that he cares about the specifics of our lives. He doesn't have compassion and pity in general terms. He doesn't ask you or require of you to put on some religious mask or jump over moral hurdles in order to make yourself religiously acceptable or lovable by God. He has compassion for you. It says he went up to him. He draws close to the man. He comes close to you and to me. Even right now, God is here in this place. He brings his presence, his reality close to us. And then he bandages our wounds, tending specifically to the type of wound you and I have endured in this pain-filled world. God does not deal in generalities. He deals in specifics. He doesn't so love the world as a blob. He loves you. He sees and knows the wounds in your life. And that means in Jesus' death that there is nothing that you have done that he can't forgive and heal. And there is nothing that has been done to you that he can't meet you in that devastation specifically and lovingly heal and restore you. He himself personally bandages the wounds. He doesn't outsource this to an institution. He himself ministers to our past, our pain, offering us salvation, offering us healing. What else is God like? What else is Jesus like? He lifts the man up. He lifts us up. In other words, he doesn't leave us rotting on the side of the road in bondage to the things that are ruining our lives and relationships. He can lift us out and up. And he carries us to a place of safety and takes care of us. And then it says he leaves provision for a further period of time until his return. That's the promise ultimately of Jesus' return. But provision for us. This is what a loving God looks like in a traumatized world. And so I want to ask you this evening, would you like to encounter that kind of God? Would you like to invite that loving God to meet you in the specifics of your life, your wounds, your roadside, where you might be lying today? Would you like to know him? The promise of Jesus is that for every single one of us, all we have to do is ask and he will come near. He will draw near. This loving God is for us in our traumatized world.